many of those caught up in the tragedy say they now feel much more vulnerable in public. The powers of security guards trained to protect the community are under intense scrutiny tonight, but a solution won't be found in more firearms. As Westfield tries to grapple with how best to reopen its shopping centre... We expect that to take a, a number of days. It must also work out how to keep its visitors safe. And now they know that women were targeted. They're very scared to come back. Bill works in a salon with his partner who was there on Saturday. Just like I can't go back there, security don't have any weapons, they got nothing. The 25 guards who were there have radios but that's it. With a review into security by Westfield underway. The answer under the Premier's watch won't be gun. Now the government is not considering policy changes in relation to stun guns or firearms. I understand security guard Peraz Tahir had only completed a handful of shifts before turning up to work here on Saturday, but to get his security licence would have only required the completion of a multiple choice quiz and some role play. You don't have the pressure of being in the real world. It is quite a basic course. Um, it's typically not going to be too much more than you know you might do to get a forklift ticket or, or to do your RSA. Westfield disagrees. They undergo significant training as uh, licensed security officers, uh, guards. I think that the response system worked well. A sentiment Saturday's shoppers might find hard to fathom. Are you safe in a shopping centre? The security, you're safe here. And now she... That's gone. Tom Saker, 7... A fascination with knives, a frustration with women and a long history of severe mental illness. Today, more shocking details have emerged about the murderer behind Bondi's mass stabbing, which left six dead and a nation reeling. This is so horrendous that I can't even explain it. Under the weight of a nation's grief... The parents of 40-year-old Bondi knifeman Joel Couchy appeared outside their Toowoomba home. I'm so sorry about what our son has done. If he was in his right mind, he would be absolutely devastated. They'd been worried about their son since high school, when he was diagnosed with schizophrenia at 17. Since then, he'd been taking medication. But in recent years, after doctors thought he was doing better, he stopped. They never expected it would end like this. The family recognising Joel as the horror unfolded, contacting police. This is a parent's absolute nightmare when they have a child with mental illness. Tributes pouring in today for the six victims killed in his mass stabbing spree at Bondi Junction. We're you know, shocked and, and traumatised and heartbroken. It's a place of, of love, of fun, of peace, uh, and it was shattered by this just incomprehensible act of cruelty and violence. The sixth victim identified as 27-year-old Chinese international student Yishuan Chen. She'd called her fiancé moments before the attack to show him the outfits she was trying on. Families are in mourning today. Lives have been devastated as a result of these criminal actions. Eight people remain in hospital. But in some good news, the nine-month-old baby, whose mum was killed trying to save her, looks like she'll pull through. In darkest of times comes sometimes the brightest of lights. And I was delighted to be informed that she's moved from critical to serious police are now looking at whether Couchy was deliberately targeting women. The gender breakdown here is concerning and New yeah. South Wales police have said that they're looking at that as part of the investigation here. The videos speak for themselves, don't they? It's obvious to detectives that seems to be an area of interest that the offender had focused on women and avoided the men. He wanted a girlfriend and he got no social skills and um, he was frustrated out of his brain. As questions emerge about how such an unwell man was able to slip through the cracks. We spend billions on mental health every year, but if it's going to the right places, if it's spent in the right way, if the quantum is enough, will be the focus of our inquiry. The you is a monster. To me, he was a very sick boy. To me, he was a very sick boy. Then, of course, there's the mental well-being of everyone watching on as this story unfolds. Georgie Harmon is the CEO of Beyond Blue and is with us now. Georgie, this, this is an unthinkable tragedy. How as a nation do we even begin to process a terrible event like this? Look, I think the thing to first say is that if you're having all these feelings, and they're big feelings for many, it's actually really normal and natural to feel them. So don't beat yourself up about it. You know, be, be, a, be a friend to yourself and be a friend to those around you. Um, the biggest, and I think the most powerful thing we
we can do right now is to turn to each other and find those social connections. Um, spending time with your mates, spending time with your family, watching a silly movie, going for a walk. If you've got a dog, you know, give it a scratch behind its ears. Um, these are the things that just provide those little moments of relief and remind us that actually these are very rare events. Um, in terms of what we do with these feelings, um, we keep an eye on them. Um, we do all those things to look after ourselves and each other. Um, and they will pass for most of us. But don't feel afraid to reach out for support as early as possible. The moment you start to think that actually this is hanging around for a bit longer than I like. Georgia, we saw the amazing photograph of the father with the two small children where he'd covered their eyes with masks. Is there some message in that about protecting younger children from hearing too much and seeing too much of this? Yeah, look, absolutely. And it's sometimes, Steve, it's, it's, it's really difficult to protect our kids from this stuff when it's everywhere. Um, the 24-7 news cycle, you know, social media, they will find a way or inadvertently see stuff that we don't want them to see. Um, and we can't bubble wrap them, you know, but what we can do is be prepared to, to help them to learn how to respond to great tragedies like this and they'll look to us and they'll watch us and they'll see how we're actually processing our own emotions so be ready for those questions don't disencourage them as a family sit down and actually talk about it and use really plain simple honest language it's actually okay to say to kids look we don't know why this happened um, we may never know why this happened I don't have the answers but you are safe mum and dad are safe or your parents your family's safe um, and these are very rare events and focus on the helpers focus on these incredible acts of courage and bravery that bring us together and make us our best selves as people oh, George, thanks so much for helping us for helping guide us through something like this it's really a terrible time but it's great to hear your voice on it appreciate it thank you. thank you the parents of bondi junction mass killer joel couchy have spoken of their torment as they come to grips with the horrific actions of their son his father andrew has described loving a monster while breaking down in tears for his son's victims all six people murdered by joel couchy have now been revealed with international student Yi Xuan Cheng named this morning. They are a mother and a father trying to comprehend the sins of their son. I love my son. I give my life for him. I love him dearly. And, you know, how do you love a monster? Give birth to him. The parents, Joel Couchy, with a message for his victim's fans. I'm extremely sorry. I'm heartbroken for you. I can't. Look, this is so horrendous that I can't even explain it. We are just ordinary people who brought up our son as best we could. As a boy, they say, he was happy, intelligent. He was brought up in love. He was, he was a love child. He had lots of friends until he got sick. But as an adult, he struggled with mental health. He lived at home in Toowoomba until 35, then went off his medication off the rails. I made myself a servant to my son when I found out he had a mental illness. His father says he even confiscated five U.S. Army knives Joel brought home. I took them off him and it would help, you know, really help. What did he say? Oh, he went mental. And on Saturday, they recognised him straight away as the Bondi mass killer. Do you have any reason to understand why you would have targeted women? Yes. Why? Because he wanted a girlfriend and he's got no social skills and um, he was frustrated out of his brain. Well, this is a parent's absolute nightmare when they have a child with a mental illness that something like this would happen. And my heart goes out to the people our son has hurt. And here, the faces of the six people who died. Identified today, Chinese student Yi Xuan Cheng, who was on the phone to her boyfriend in China when the line went dead. Dawn Singleton had just bought her wedding dress. As the carnage unfolded, her father, ad man John Singleton, rang his friend, Ray Hadley, trying to find answers. He said, I think my Dawny um, is one of those who's lost their life. And, um, I can't confirm it. Can you do something? Hadley rang the police commissioner, who confirmed the news. I had the job of ringing John back and officially confirming that his dear darling daughter had been stabbed to death by this lunatic. Dawn's fiance Ash, is a policeman who was called in to help at Bondi, but then quickly taken away by colleagues. Overnight, a vigil was held by friends of Westfield security guard Faraz Tahir, who was killed on his first ever day shift. That he was a very brave person. He faced, you know, whatever the situation was, and he tried his best to save the life of the others. And then there's Ashley Good, the mother who passed her injured baby to the safe hands of strangers as she died. Today, her little girl showed improvement in hospital. She's moved from critical to serious. 
Uh, that is a big change and a significant improvement. The Premier today promising answers. A coronial inquiry similar to the Lint siege inquest. Examining the events of Saturday but also this man's interactions with the New South Wales government and any government agencies in Queensland. And how a sick mind became a mass killer. Daniel Sutton for 10 News First. The Westfield at the centre of this attack is no longer a crime scene, but it is the site of immense grief tonight with floral tributes growing as Sydney and the nation tries to grapple with the mass murder of innocent citizens. Flags flew at half-mast across the country as part of a national day of mourning, while the Opera House will tonight light up in tribute. In the shadows of a scene, a crime so unthinkable, tributes are laid for those who lost their lives here. Handwritten notes among the flowers for all victims and their families. Our hearts are absolutely broken for the people that went shopping <laughs> and didn't come home. Just tragic, like, like it's not real. Like you see that kind of stuff and it's just not real. Yeah, it just touches, touches home a little bit. Among the recognisable faces, former PM Malcolm Turnbull. This, is, this, is, this hurts everybody and hurts all Australians, all of us. The Governor-General and his wife professing despair, drawing comparison to the 2014 Lindt Cafe siege. So when something like this just so abrupt changes uh, the pattern of what you feel, of course we all feel it. No more so than those who saw the worst of it. I, honestly, I'm still trying to figure it out what I've seen and I wish I wasn't there at all. This was the moment acting on instinct Bill corralled strangers into his partner's salon. Yeah, and I quickly take everybody into the shop. An older man comes in as well, a mother, a child. I take them all into the back room, I lock the doors and they're like, we're going to die, they're going to shoot us, they're killing us. He can't say when his partner will return to Bondi. She said she's, every time she sees someone walking towards her, she thinks that they got a knife and they're going to stab her. Support's being offered and shown in many ways. From the Harbour Bridge to Parliament House, flags fly at half-mast. This is a community in mourning, but it's a nation in mourning. Financial help and counselling is now available through the state's victim support scheme, though everyone wishes it wasn't needed. Let's go to Samara Gardner now at Bondi Westfield tonight. Samara, the operators there have in fact given an up. They just have, Sandra. While Bondi Westfield is no longer a crime scene, it is still closed and it could remain so for a number of days. That's so uh, the staff at the centre can mourn what has happened. It's also so so that a major review of the security arrangements at the centre can continue. The families of the victims of uh, Saturday's massacre have also been offered the opportunity to come inside before the centre reopens to the public. While the public r largely remains on the outside of the, the shopping precinct, they are rallying together here, trying to come to terms with what's happening. Uh, that's a scene that is mirrored across the city tonight. Tonight, a black ribbon will be projected onto the Opera House Ales, a true sign of this city in mourning. Indeed. All right, Samara, thank you. Let's go to Kaziah Dawn now. She's at the Sydney Children's Hospital for us tonight. Kaziah, you have some good news about the youngest victim. Sandra, I certainly do, and we are just waiting for the official word that the nine-month-old daughter of victim Ash Good has been moved from the intensive care unit here at Sydney Children's Hospital into a ward after her condition downgraded from critical to serious but stable. She is one of seven patients who are still receiving treatment at hospitals across Sydney after another female patient was released from Prince of Wales Hospital this afternoon. We still have two patients at St Vincent's, a 24-year-old male and a 22-year-old female are both in ICU. Another female at Royal North Shore is also serious but stable. We have two more patients at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, a male in a stable condition and a female who is also in ICU. We also have a female in a stable condition at St George. I'll just recap as well. So five patients in total who were injured in Saturday's attack have since been released from hospitals and that wouldn't have been possible without the hard work of medical and emergency staff which is why the health minister says he has been privately visiting them again today to say thank you. Sandra? 
Kazaya Dawn reporting there, thank you. From the harrowing scene, Bondi has emerged stories of true heroism. Two men use bollards to try to stop the killer, running towards danger in a desperate attempt to save lives. <coughs> they spoke exclusively to Seven. The ultimate act of bravery, confronting an armed suspect during his killing spree. We tried to catch him, but he was going down the stairs. Then we saw him going down, so we followed him from the top, tried to maybe like throw the bullet to him, but we couldn't. Tradies Damien Garot and Silas Depro had just arrived at the Bondi shopping centre, watching in horror as Joel Couchy stabbed random shoppers. I don't know, we just think like, we need something to catch him. Each grabbed a bollard to hold him off. We didn't think, he's like, you cannot think at that moment, just like adrenaline, actually. The eyes was like empty eyes. It was like, uh, he wasn't there. They hurled the bollards at Couchy, but he escaped. Not giving up, Damien grabbed a chair and gave chase, alerting acting inspector Amy Scott, who confronted Couchy, shooting him dead. She was actually the hero. She, she, she did the job. This couple, who owns a nearby cafe, trembled in fear as Inspector Scott fired the shot that ended it all. I have to admit, she was amazing. If it wasn't for her, I shudder to think what may have happened. But Scott told her boss these selfless mates helped take him down. She said, Minister, I just want to say those bystanders that were there as well, they did such a great job, you know, just incredibly humble. When we saw now actually today his picture compared to the picture from yesterday, from when we saw him yesterday was totally different. The pair, just two of many strangers who stepped in, risking their own lives, like the manager of this Vodafone store who saved Sally McCallum and son Buster. He stood out in the store the whole time and left all of us out in the safe area out the back. University student Gabriella Goot was working inside an Another store heard the shot and ushered panicked customers into a fire exit. Friends sort of crouched down, we turned the lights off. Best in this state confronted one of the worst acts we've ever seen. Silas is a permanent Australian resident, but Damien's visa expires in July with calls to reward his bravery with citizenship. I reckon he's earned it, yeah, yeah. He can, he can come stay at my place if he needs. I think he definitely deserves it, yeah. He would pass.